Would you pray with me? Father, we confess it together with these beautiful children and with our wonderful choir. You are God over all, and you are forever praised. Well, we're so incredibly grateful to get to be your people and to get to come into this place. We're bringing with us everything the week has brought us and laying it at your feet, knowing, Lord, that you are bigger than everything we face. And you, O oh Lord, are God over the cosmos. And if you're God over the cosmos, and you can keep the sun shining and the moon coming out at night and the stars twinkling from light years away, Lord, if you can do all that, surely you are more than able to handle our lives. And so, Lord, we're so grateful, so grateful to get to know you, so grateful to get to rest in you, so grateful to get to come to you. And we pray that we would truly have an encounter with you, even now as we turn to your word. Speak to our hearts. Transform us by the renewing of our minds. Make us more like Jesus, for it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. And when we gather together to worship every single week, we do so bringing everything that we've collected over the week with us, don't we? And we come to worship because we need to be reminded that our God who is transcendent, God who is not bound by space or time, God who is truly over all, He is also eminent. That our God who could remain separate from us, our God who could remain far off, He has come near. And the reason that He's come near to people even like you and me is because He loves us. He shouldn't, but He does. He loves us more than we can understand, more than we can imagine. And so when we come to him bringing everything that the week has brought to us, we can know that he is bigger than all of it. But we can also know not only that he's bigger than all of it, but that in his great love for us, he's come near. He's come near so that we might know him, that we might be known by him, and that we might be in relationship with him. And I don't know about you, but to me there's no greater truth that we could ever imagine, no greater truth that we could ever experience that our God who made us has come for us, and he's come to us so that we can be with him. Our God is over all. What does it look like when a human being comes into contact with Almighty God? Now, before you start Googling or searching it up on YouTube, let's go to a more trustworthy source. I'm sure there are some <laughs> videos <laughs> on YouTube of what does it look like when a person encounters God. Um, I, I don't know how trustworthy those are, but I do know that God's Word is completely trustworthy and true. So over the next several weeks, we're going to look to God's Word to let God show us encounters between God and human beings just like you and me. And I think we're going to learn a little bit about worship as we see these encounters. We're going to start today with Moses. Now, there's nobody like Moses. I mean, Moses was unbelievable. I mean, even the, the account of his birth, he was born at a time when the Pharaoh, the king over Egypt, and ostensibly the king of the whole world at the time, had made a decree that no Hebrew baby boys should live. That if you were a Hebrew baby boy, you were inconvenient to the king, you were inconvenient to the kingdom, you were therefore inconvenient to your parents, and so the midwives had an order to murder you as soon as you were born. But God, in his grace, gave Moses a mama and a daddy who were unwilling to murder their child because that child was inconvenient for them. And so they hid the baby. And when the time came that they could hide him no more, this mother, who trusted God with her son's life, put him in a basket and floated him down the Nile, trusting that God would take care of that baby boy. And God did, didn't he? No doubt she prayed for that baby as that basket floated toward the daughter of the very king who had issued the decree that he should not live. And no doubt she prayed as Pharaoh's daughter took up that baby and loved that child and said, I will raise him as my own. And no doubt she thanked God, this mother of this beautiful baby, as she was welcome to be the child's wet nurse. 
And as God would raise up this child in the palace of the Pharaoh, loved and nurtured by his own biological mother, and adopted by a mom who would raise him up and give him a beautiful life. There was something special about this Moses. God had blessed him. And then when Moses was 40, he became a murderer. He killed somebody. And then he became a fugitive from justice. And so at age 40, he went out into the wilderness and tended the sheep of the man who would become his father-in-law. And he was out in the wilderness just taking care of the sheep. And how many of you have learned sheep are not God's smartest creatures? I guess that's why Jesus keeps referring to us as sheep in the New Testament, because we also are not always God's smartest creatures. Amen? Amen. But he tended to the sheep in the wilderness for 40 years, four decades of his life, until that day when he was 80 years old and he saw on the side of the mountain a bush that was burning and yet not consumed. And the voice of the angel of the Lord came out of that bush and told Moses that at age 80, God had plans for him. You know, if I were Moses, I probably would have felt like out in the wilderness after a good 20 years that God had probably given up on me. Maybe after three decades of tending sheep and just going at it day after day, I would have thought, well, this is it. But we never know what God's going to do, do we? So at age 80, God calls Moses to be his servant to go into Egypt and to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt and toward the promised land. Moses was something else. In fact, at the end of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10 through 12, the Bible says, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. Moses had said God would one day raise up another prophet like him, but this prophet would be even greater. Moses was talking about Jesus, God's Messiah. And truly, God did. He raised up Jesus. But there was a time in Moses' journey when he asked God to let him see God. And God obliged. And we're going to look at that account today. I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Exodus chapter 34. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. If you're in the sanctuary in the Red Pew Bible in the pew rack in front of you, that is page 74. Page 74. We're going to see this account of Moses' interaction with Almighty God, and I believe we're going to learn something about worship from it. I believe that we're going to learn something about encountering the transcendent God of the cosmos who has become eminent, who's come near to us in His grace. The theme that I want to give you today is this. God says worship is humbling. God says worship is humbling. Exodus chapter 34, beginning with verse 1. These are the words of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain." Our first point today is this. Worship begins with God's mercy. Worship begins with God's mercy. Now, I told you Moses was special and that God had chosen him to be his human servant to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt. And that's exactly what had happened. God had sent Moses to Pharaoh, and God had done signs and wonders through him. 
And then when Pharaoh's heart was hardened against God and his people, God brought plagues upon Egypt. And each of the plagues was a different judgment upon some deity that the Egyptians worshipped. God was showing that he was greater than all of those little g gods that the Egyptians worshipped. And then came the tenth and final plague when God would come through and kill the firstborn of each household. But God made a way for his people to avoid that death by the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and putting the blood of the lamb, the substitutionary death, instead of the firstborn of the household, putting that blood on the lintel and doorposts of the door that God would pass over and not bring death into that household. And God had led his people out of Egypt, plundering the Egyptians, and he had revealed his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. God had been with them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God had protected them and led them and shown them the way. And and even when they came up against the Red Sea and, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened again and they pursued God's people such that God's people had the Red Sea on one side and the greatest military on the planet coming after them, God made a way miraculously through the midst of the Red Sea. And you can even see now there are wagon wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea upon which coral has grown, giving physical evidence that this event in the Bible is truly a historical event. God made a way where there was no way. How many of you found that our God is able to make a way where there is no way? Amen? Well, God made a way where there was no way, and God brought them through, and God defeated the Egyptians. God gave them manna from heaven. And when they complained because frosted flakes from heaven weren't enough, God gave them quail. When they needed water, in one instance, God made bitter water sweet by his miraculous power. And in another instance, God brought forth water from a rock to nourish and hydrate his people. God had done so much. When Amalek attacked, you remember Moses was up on the hill with Aaron and her, and and the battle was in the valley, but the real battle was on top of the hill where Moses' hands were raised. And and even when his hands got tired and began to droop and God's people began to lose down in the valley, Aaron and her lifted up Moses' hands because by the strength of the Lord, they would conquer those who would attack them. God's people had seen God move in miraculous ways. And God had brought them to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 19, God said, if you will keep my covenant and if you will obey my commands, then although all the people of the earth are mine, you will be to be a special people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And you remember that holy means set apart, distinct, different, uncommon, not like everybody else. So I will make you a kingdom of priests to me and a holy nation set apart from the whole world because even though the whole world is mine, you will be my special treasured possession. God called Moses up on the mountain and God gave them the Ten Commandments. Actually, the Ten Commandments were a summary. There were 613 commandments. And God made a way for them to be in covenant relationship with Almighty God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God made a way for them to know him and to be known by him and to be in relationship to him. And you remember, maybe you just saw the movie. They always play on ABC the night before Easter. The Ten Commandments, you remember? While Moses was up on the mountain, he was delayed, and what happened? The people became impatient. Is it possible for us to ever become impatient with God? How many of you would confess this morning that there have been times that you wanted God to move on your schedule and you weren't content with his schedule? I'll raise my hand for you because I deal with it myself. And they became impatient because Moses was gone for a long time, and so they got it in their mind, well, maybe Moses is dead, maybe he's not coming back. Tell you what, let's do. How about we make ourselves our own God? You know, the gods of the Egyptians had statues, so let's have a God that 
is a statue for us. We can still say this is the God that brought us out. We can still worship this God. Everything will be fine, but tell you what let's do. Let's throw all our gold to Aaron and have him craft for us a golden calf, and we'll worship that calf. And so as Moses was coming down the mountain with the tablets written by the very finger of God, giving the summary of God's law, he heard the sound of what Joshua thought was war in the camp. But it wasn't war against another nation, was it? It was war against Almighty God. It was a sound of debauchery. And so Moses took those tablets, and what did he do? He threw them, and they broke. You know, if, if I had been God in that moment, I believe I might have been done. After everything that I had just done for these people, in rescuing them from slavery, in bringing them out, in feeding them frosted flakes from heaven, and when they complained about that, they wanted some meat, I brought them quail. And when they needed water, I made Mara's water sweet. When they needed water, I brought water out of a rock. You know, you don't see too many rocks just bursting forth and overflowing with water these days. If I had done all of that, if I had made a way miraculously through the Red Sea, if I had drowned the army of the Egyptians, and if I had been there present with them as a pillar of fire by day, or a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, I might have probably just been done at this point. You know what? I'm out. But that's not the character of our God, is it? No, our God was merciful toward his people. We see this beautiful moment where Moses intercedes for the people, and God is merciful. You know, worship begins with God's mercy toward us. As we've gathered here this morning, whether you're in the room or you're joining by virtual means, you've got to join me in confessing that you have sinned. For all have sinned, the Bible says, and fall short of the glory of God. And you might be better than your neighbor, but guess what? Your neighbor's not the standard. The standard is God's perfection. And so if in any way you have fallen short of the standard of perfect, not according to your estimation, but according to God's law and God's estimation of your attempt then you deserve death and hell, just like me. But God is merciful. God is merciful. He's so much more merciful than you and me. How many of y'all have wished that there was a police officer around when somebody was driving like a maniac around you? You've just wished. You've wished that you were like those 1970s detective shows where they have the secret siren and they can put it out on the car, you know, and go get them. How many, just, just for a minute, if I could be a police officer at the right moment, I could get them. And I mean, they'd never drive again. Their insurance premium would go through the roof. But what about when we're driving like maniacs? You still want justice? No. That's why you tap the brakes every time you see a police officer, you sinner. <laughs> They're laughing because they know. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, if I were God, I'd have been done with me a long time ago. But God is merciful and gracious. Our orchestra played a beautiful arrangement of amazing grace. And His grace truly is amazing that He who is God over all would, would forgive even people like us. Psalm 130 verses 3 and 4 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? That's a hypothetical question, but let's give it a less than hypothetical answer. Nobody. If the Lord should mark iniquities, no one could stand. But the psalmist continues and says, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Worship begins with an overwhelming sense that our God, who could have been done with us and probably should have been done with us a long time ago, hasn't given up on us. He loves us. And he extends his mercy toward us. 
And that's exactly what's happening. The reason Moses had broken the tablets was because God's people had sinned. They had turned against God. They weren't at war with another people group. They were at war with Almighty God. And do you know the New Testament says that apart from Christ, we also were at war with Almighty God? Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So, we also were God's enemies, objects of His righteous wrath, and yet, in His great love for us, He didn't give up on us. He sent His only begotten Son so that we might know Him and be in everlasting relationship with Him. So God told Moses to do something. Let's see what Moses did. Verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. Our second point. Worship requires our obedience. Worship requires our obedience. Notice what Moses did. This is very simple. God said, do this, and guess what Moses did? That. I've told y'all before, there are plenty of people who've come to me over the years and said, what do you do, Pastor Jeff, with the hard parts of the Bible? You know, the parts that that are really hard to understand. And there are some parts of the Bible that are hard to understand, there's no doubt. But I don't struggle with those nearly as much as I struggle with the ones that are super easy to understand. You know, God says, don't, and yet my flesh wants me to do. God says do, and my flesh recoils and says don't. Those are the ones that I struggle with more because, well, I don't don't have any way that I can say, well, I wasn't sure what you were saying there, God. No, it's pretty clear. Those are the ones I struggle with the most. And what Moses does here, same thing Noah did. God said, build an ark in the desert. So Noah built an ark. God told Moses, make two new tablets. So Moses made two new tablets. You know, what has God told us to do that we're holding back on? Do you know that that God desires worship from our lives more than He desires worship from our lips? Of course, he, He loves to hear us sing His praises. I can't imagine the joy that it brought our God for our choir and our children's choir to join together. Was that not incredible? Beautiful. But God desires worship from our lives even more than He desires worship from our lips. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel said to Saul, has the, Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. So God says the best way that we can worship Him is with our lives simply by doing what he's asked us to do and simply in the power of the Holy Spirit by not doing what he's told us not to do. Jesus carried this forth into the New Testament in John 3, 36. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And later, John, the beloved disciple, records in his gospel in chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In John 14, verse 21, Jesus said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then again in John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is not salvation by works. This is work springing forth from the salvation God has given us in the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing. We receive Christ. We say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve death and hell, but I believe you loved me so much that you sent Jesus, your only begotten son, to live a sinless life, to die a brutal death on the old rugged cross for me in my place to pay for all of my sin. And I believe the third day he arose from the grave and he's alive today. 
and I turn away from my life of sin to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And the Bible says when we do that, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit dwelling within us enables us to actually live lives that are pleasing to God following His commandments. And so it's not that because I'm in Christ, I can just go murder now. That's not it. But because I'm in Christ, I have the capacity through the Holy Spirit to not hate people. Obedience. It's not salvation by works, but it's because I'm saved, the works of the Holy Spirit come out of me. Moses obeyed, and God calls us to obey. Verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Our third point, worship reveals God to me. Worship reveals God to me. God comes and and he is allowing Moses to be in his proximity. And God reveals himself by his name, and by his own description of himself. Many times throughout the Old Testament, they would return to exactly what God said here to Moses, and they would describe God in that way, using God's description of himself to proclaim his excellencies in their worship. You know, it's an amazing thing. When we worship God, here's what happens. When we truly worship God, we fix our attention on him. And as we fix our attention on Him and lay aside distractions, you know what happens? We see Him better. We see Him better. How many of you have found when you put your phone down and pay attention to the person you're with, you see that person better? I've told husbands in premarital counseling, husbands-to-be for many years, there's a difference between listening with your ears and listening with your eyes. And your wife wants you to listen with your eyes. That means in the world of the DVR, pause the live TV and look at her. Now, I'm getting myself in trouble because my wife later this afternoon is going to say, hey, didn't I hear a preacher say you should listen with your eyes? I'll deal with that later. But when we focus on God, He becomes clearer to us. When we lay aside distractions, all the things that pull us away, and we look to Him. That's why when you're suffering, you get to know God better, because your suffering causes you to lay aside the things you didn't even realize were distractions, and fix your gaze upon the Lord. And He reveals Himself. And so you may be saying, you know, I… I don't know, I just haven't had a lot of interaction with God lately. It doesn't feel like He's near. Well, maybe the problem's not His proximity to you. Maybe it's your distractedness. Get alone with Him. Lay aside all the distractions and just look to Him. Verse 8, And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Our fourth and final point. Worship leads me to humble reliance upon God. Worship leads me to humble reliance upon God. I'll go ahead and give it away. Spoiler alert for the next several weeks. When human beings encounter God, they respond in humble worship. So when Moses has this encounter with Almighty God, he bows immediately and he worships. Now let me tell you something, that's what we're going to do too. 
If you've ever said, when I get to heaven, I've got a few questions for the Lord that he's going to need to answer before I can settle in. No, you don't. You don't. Trust me. We're going to see that repeatedly over the course of this, these next several weeks. You, you don't. Our only question is, why in the world would you let somebody me, like me in a place like this near somebody like you? I don't belong here. But I'll be honest with you, as I navigate life, I, I find myself asking questions for which I don't have answers. And maybe you do too. And our God in His mercy doesn't shun us when that happens. He welcomes us to look to Him, to focus on Him, to lay aside our distractions and to see Him more clearly for who He is. You know, I heard a theologian say that the reason Job, who was pretty upset about his situation, the reason Job was lifted up by God and his friends who were there to defend God, God doesn't need your defense, but they were there to defend God. The reason that, Mo, that Job was righteous in God's eyes was because Job took his complaint directly to the Lord. Do you do that? You should. I should too. Don't talk about God. Talk to God. You got issues? Trust me, he's bigger than all of our issues. And he says, come to me. You're weary and heavy laden? Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'll give you rest. But so often we don't do that, do we? We, we complain about God to other people. Well, I can't believe it. God says, come to me. Moses encountered Almighty God, and he bowed in worship. And then, notice what he did. He asked God for help. Do you know that that is worshipful in and of itself? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's John 15, 5. But God's Word tells us that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And asking Him for help is worshipful. So go to Him. Worship Him. Ask Him for help. 